Hi everyone, so this week I wanted to review an old set of rules, first published in 1982. Now my copy wasn't bought that far back, I hasten to add, I bought them about five years ago. And I got them because this rule book was the inspiration for a much more streamlined set of rules that Stuart, the postie of Posties Rejects, had put together for our group. So I was interested in seeing what the original rule set had in common with the game that we have so often enjoyed in the Shed of War. So let's start with some basic details. This is a 34 page A5 booklet printed in black and white. The text is fairly small, but this just means there's a lot more information crammed into the covers of this slim volume. Now, I'm not sure if this is a traditionally printed book. Instead, it looks more like an early photocopy, or maybe it was printed on a risograph or something like that. I'm not sure. My copy of the book is going a little bit yellow with age, but it's still readable and has become a go-to reference book for reasons that will soon become clear as we look at the contents. Now in a short contents page, the first 10 pages of the book are history and information about the Anglo-Zulu War and conflicts with the Boer. This is followed by a very interesting look at the tactics used by Imperial troops, the Boer, and of course the Zulus and other indigenous nations. This is just a brief introduction, but it is still a fascinating and useful insight into the forces that these rules will be covering. Then this booklet moves on to the rules themselves. It was written with the assumption of a ground scale of one millimetre equals two yards for figures between six and 15 millimetre tall. And for 25 to 28 millimetre figures, it's one millimetre equals one yard. Now each model is assumed to represent 15 men, and the number is important to remember for later when calculating casualties. Now these rules can be used with different size figures. Indeed, there's a table explaining what base sizes to use for 25 millimetre, 15 millimetre, and five millimetre. So 28 millimetre, 15, and six millimetre in the range is available today. Then there are some notes on setting up a game, which talks about nominating commanders and organising those figures into units. So for example, these rules assume that a British infantry battalion will consist of about 56 to 64 figures, divided into 8 companies of 7 or 8 figures each. Cavalry squadrons will be about 6 figures strong, and the artillery batteries will consist of 6 field gun models. For the Zulus, the book suggests between 34 and 134 figures strong for each unit. Now all of this feels a little bit dated compared to more modern rules, but that level of detail enables you to understand the delicate mathematics behind the author's calculations. The sequence of play is divided into six steps. First, all movement is resolved, including units that are routing and those that are charging. Second, this is followed by a recovery phase, basically morale tests, to rally routing units. Third, there is a firing phase, which is itself subdivided into small arms fire first, followed by cannon and rocket firing. The fourth phase is the reaction tests for any units that took casualties from fire. And then the penultimate phase is hand-to-hand -hand combat melee. And the final step is the seat in the sequence of play is the army commander's reaction test. Now we enter a section where the rules get detailed in a way that modern rules probably wouldn't. So there's a very granular section on visibility under different types of conditions. The next section discusses how sound, such as distant gunfire or shouted orders can be heard, over what distances and what factors can reduce those distances. And there's also a section on wind and how it would affect the carrying of sound. Further sections discuss the use of sentries and the use of signalling, and many of these sec in the, the rules in this section are really what might be come under the term command and control in a modern rule set. The section on movement breaks types of movement down into walking, running, jogging, and charges, or canter and gallop for cavalry, and gives different distances in yards for different troop types, such as imperial, imperial troops, Boer and Zulus. Again, this is extremely detailed compared to modern rule sets, but I found it fascinating and presents the player and the modern day rules writer with lots of information to think about. The section on combat, of course, goes into even more detail about firing and hand-to-hand -hand combat, but also includes rules on being able to fire over the heads of troops that are in front or in lower positions. 
the operation of crew served weapons like Gatling guns and firing on the move or firing into a melee. Then there's a huge table that breaks down ranges and hit factors for different types of weapons from rifles through to rockets. Modifiers can then be applied for different situations such as European infantry charging a steady Zulu force minus two or firing if range markers are set at plus one. The rules really test your math skills here because once you've calculated the appropriate weapon factor and its modifiers, you go to another table to look at the number of figures firing to find out how many real enemy troops have become casualties. Then you need to divide that number by 15 to find out how many figures to remove. By modern standard, this is a very clunky and unnecessarily complicated way to achieve the end result. Now this book isn't all about knowing your maths. Towards the end of the rule book, there's actually a really interesting five page section on campaigns. I think there's some really useful ideas in here and could probably be applied regardless of the rule system that you're using. In particular, it discusses orders and communications between separate commands and talks about resupply and field engineering. This section also provides rules for determining the quality of commanders. So the author uses a rating system whereby commanders are assigned one of five quality ratings from A to for, for good, decisive and responsible commanders through to E for poor or indecisive commanders. The author then applies this rating system to historical commanders during the Anglo-Zulu War. So for instance, Colonel Richard Thomas Glenn, commander of the Central Column during the First Invasion, is rated as a C, while Colonel Evelyn Wood, commander of the left flank during the Second Invasion, is rated as an A. Towards the end of this booklet, there's an appendix listing the troops that were available to each of the British commands at different points during the Anglo-Zulu War. Now I found this to be a very useful order of battle for the whole campaign, and a really useful resource even if you're not playing with these rules. Finally, there's a short bibliography at the end of the book, which includes some of the expected books from the time, including a couple of Ospreys, books by authors like Donald Featherstone, and of course, Donald Morris's Washing of the Spears. Now, while I've repeatedly emphasised the complexity of these rules, it has to be said, this rule set does also come with a pull-out quick reference sheet, something that I thought was a relatively modern innovation in rules design. It's printed on cardboard with all of the tables from the rulebook that the player would need during the gameplay. So having described the rulebook, would I recommend them? Well, I suspect that most modern wargamers would struggle to use these rules as written. However, I would urge anyone interested in this particular period not to overlook this book, simply because it contains so much fascinating and useful information that you can then adapt and use in your own rules. The section on sentries and how sound can be heard can be lifted out of this rule set and used in other games quite easily. And I found things like the table of ranges for the different weapon types to be quite fascinating, very instructive, and again, useful if you're considering writing your own rules and need to consider weapon ranges. I'm not sure any modern rule books would give ranges in yards, of course, rather than centimetres or inches, but it does give the rules writer with real world data that could be turned into a set of workable and more streamlined rules. So while I'd probably give this a low playability rating, I still score the rules very high for the quality and detail of the research that's gone into writing them. You can usually pick up a copy of these rules for under a tenner, and I think if you did get them, you would not be disappointed. If nothing else, they show how far Wargames rules have come in the last 40 years and maybe allow a better appreciation of the value of streamlined, easy play rules which seem to be prevalent today.